All right, our next speaker is Kevin Murphy. Kevin is a research scientist at Google. Uh, he did his PhD at Berkeley back in 2002, uh, a postdoc at MIT, and then um, was a faculty member at uh, University of British Columbia for many years until leaving for Google in 2012, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, 2011. Oh. <laughs> five years, almost my five year anniversary at Google. Um, oh wait, I should use this thing, right? Yes. Is it Can everyone hear the um, wearable mic? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so I, um, I'm going to talk about machine learning and its applications to computer vision. If I can make this work. What do I need, the green button? Uh, no, I don't know. It's your it? laptop. Oh, that was, that was mine. Oh. <laughs> but I, can, I, can. I can just use the keyboard. No, no, no. I don't care. Let me, I can just switch it on. I'm happy yeah. to use the keyboard. No, no, here, here. Okay. So, um, yeah, sure. Uh, so, okay, so this result, probably everyone in the room knows, uh, it's already been mentioned several times today. The ImageNet classification challenge is a, sort of considered a hard benchmark in computer vision, and the progress in recent years has been pretty amazing um, in terms of reducing the error rate. And you know, this has resulted in practical applications that I'm sure you're familiar with. This is just one example that Google launched, uh, I guess, last year, uh, photo search. You can just type in a tag, and it will pull up images that match that tag, and it works really well. Um, and it's quite impressive. Um, and what's going on behind the scenes is deep convolutional neural nets, which we've just heard about. OK, so why are we using this? Well, they work well in practice. Tom Poggio gave us some theoretical reasons why they should work well in practice. And another factor that hasn't, wasn't, hasn't been mentioned um, in the previous talk is, OK, maybe we can get kernel methods to match performance in these classification problems. But we also care about runtime efficiency. And those kernel methods are often quite slow. So if I'm going to project up to 500,000 basis functions, that's just too slow. Like, we can't afford a billion parameters. I want this thing to fit in my, in my phone right, and run in real time. So these things uh, are a pain to train. But once they're trained, they're very fast. There's actually a very cute demo. This guy, I've forgotten his name, but uh, he's a student at Berkeley. He pre-trains a ConvNet to do MNIST digit classification. And then he implemented an Excel spreadsheet to do the computations with fixed weights. And you can actually draw the digit in cells in Excel, and it will classify for you. I mean, these things are just very, very simple circuits, right? So you can embed them into hardware and so on. So they have a lot of desirable properties even if training is still a bit of a nightmare. Um, so I, if that's the hammer, what's the, the system that makes the hammers? Well, at Google, we are pushing TensorFlow, um, which I'm sure you've all heard about. So this is an open source deep learning library. There's several other libraries that are similar in spirit. Um, you know, the main benefit of this is that it does automatic differentiation. So you just write down your objective, and then you get the gradients for free. The second benefit is it handles all of the systems issues for you. So it distributes nicely across multiple GPUs and restarts. And you know we have great systems people at Google. And as a machine learning guy, I don't have to worry about that. And that's awesome. Um, OK, so um, there's been a trend to make bigger and bigger models. Uh, Tommy uh, mentioned this morning ResNet, which is 150 layers deep. Um, so basically, the deeper these models get, the, the, the better they are. Um, they're, they're get, although they get deeper, they tend to get thinner, so that the total number of parameters is constant. But this actually helps performance and also speed. Um, so um, so it, it might, you might think we're done, right? I mean, I've actually heard people say, our oh, computer vision is solved. I'm going to move on now to do natural language understanding. We have not solved computer vision, <laughs> not by a long stretch, or at least not seen understanding, maybe classification. But uh, so here's an example. Um, uh, which some of you may have seen. Uh, I took it, I learned about this from a blog post from Andres Karpathy, but this is a, an official White House picture. So this is one of Obama's staff members. And obviously, you know, you saw the photo, some of you I heard laughing. Why is this funny, right? I mean, it takes a lot of analysis, which we do in a fraction of a second to understand why this is funny. Yeah, I, for those who don't notice, like he's stepping on the scale there, right? Um, so what would it take for a machine to really understand this scene? Um, well, let's look at where we are right now. Basically, most deployed vision systems, all they do is give you a bag of labels, right? They're multi-label classifiers. So it might say something like Obama person weighing scale. OK, that's really not very helpful. Um, OK, we can go a little further. We can do object detection. Um, so we're going to get a bunch of boxes out with labels. 
Maybe we'll get a label for the whole scene. Um, so basically, the representation looks like this. OK, so this is better, but it's still extremely impoverished, right? So what would we like? What we'd really like is something more like this, where we have representations of, you know, we have bounding boxes, but we know something about the state of the objects inside. So their pose, if they're people, or their attributes. Um, we know something about the relationships between the objects. We know not just categorical information, but metric information, like the size of this object. We know something about the 3D geometry of the scene. You know, the standing on a plane, how big is the room, all of this stuff, right? Um, this is the kind of uh, detailed representation we would like, which can power all kinds of applications, like robotics, or maybe even creating a sentence to some, or a set of sentences to summarize the scene in a way that really captures the essence. And that could be useful, say, for, for blind people. Okay, so this is where we'd like to be. Um, so uh, today I'm going to tell you about a few steps we're taking to, to get towards this goal. So specifically, I'm going to start by talking about this image captioning business, which is a fun little topic. So we're actually going to do this sort of brute force approach where we go directly from the image to the sentence, and we're not going to create explicitly this intermediate representation. I don't really believe, and I think we should have an intermediate representation, but let's just have some fun and see how far we can get with the direct mapping approach. Um, and we have a slight twist on the standard thing that I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, then I'll talk about um, a problem where we want to label not just the scene with a few labels, but for every single pixel we want a label. So I call it dense labeling or semantic segmentation. Uh, and there's uh, several related problems that I'll talk about. Um, and then I'm going to talk about an application of that semantic segmentation work to an important problem, uh, an important practical problem, um, which I call the image to calories problem. Uh, so analyzing food on your cell phone, for images of food on your cell phone. Um, and then I'll have some future work slides. OK. So um, image captioning. So uh, image tagging is this, which I already mentioned. You take a, a random image like this, stick it through some model, most likely a deep confnet, and you get back a bunch of tags with confidences. OK. You know, this, work, this is what powers the photo search application and many other things. But it would be cooler if you could do something like this, if you actually generate a sentence describing the, the image, right? And so these are actual results from a neural network. This is a model trained by my, some colleagues of mine at Google, um, Oreo Vignoles and others. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how that works in a second. So um, you, know, you see these results, and it's pretty amazing. I mean, this made maybe not the front page of the New York Times, but it made it to the front page of the technology section of the New York Times. So um, you know, that's still pretty high profile. So what's going on behind the scenes? So behind the scenes, you take an image, you pass it through one of these confnets, and that basically gives you a low dimensional representation, like maybe 4,000 dimensional, of the image. And then you take that and you uh, use a recurrent neural network, which is a, a model that generates a sequence of tokens. Uh, in this case, the tokens are words. And traditionally, that's like an unsupervised language model. It just generates a word and conditional, and the previous word generates the next word. So it's, it's a um, higher order Markov model, essentially where the hidden state is represented in these neurons here. But we're going to condition the initial state of that neural network on the um, representation we derived on, from the image. So it's an image conditioned language model. Okay. Um, so if you have a data set with images and sentences, you can just train this thing by maximum likelihood. You, you, know, you do automatic differentiation in TensorFlow. It's just there like 100 lines of code. It's pretty easy. It might take a few days to train, but you know, it's not that difficult conceptually. Um, and it works really well. Um, the data set, by the way, came from Microsoft Research, MS Coco, although they call it the MS Coco data set. None of the authors are at Microsoft anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the data is still available. So this is, you know, as usual, a lot of the progress is due to data, not so much methodology. Um, although, you know, somebody had to have the idea that this would work. I mean, it's not obvious a priori it would. Um, so uh, the other, let me tell you one other story. Um, this came out. I guess it was published last year, but the, you know, it went up on archive probably January last year. And within a week, like four different groups simultaneously had more or less the same model with more or less the same results. And the groups were uh, Google, Stanford, Berkeley, and I think UCLA actually. UCLA might have been the first. Um, and I thought, what is this? There's something in the drinking water in California. And then the MSR group, which is in a different state, came out with a very similar method. So you know, it wasn't to do with the, maybe it was a West Coast thing. I don't know. Um, but basically, uh, I was having dinner with um, Vladimir Vatnik, Vatnik last night. And he was saying, sometimes ideas are just in the air. and independent. It seems like they're independently created at the same time. 
I don't know if this is independent or not, right? I mean, people are reading the same papers and going to the same conferences. Anyway, uh, so many, many groups have worked on this. This is just the, the, the Google paper, but there's a lot of things that are very similar. Okay, so it gives you results like this. It looks great. Um, and then uh, you, you, you throw a few more examples at it, and you see this. It is the two dogs playing in the grass. Well, play, not playing. Okay, it's a grammar thing, whatever. Two dogs, hmm, looks like three, maybe four. Um, okay, uh, what about this? What's it going to say? A close-up of a person eating a hot dog. <laughs> Okay, this is not good. Okay, so, you know, when it fails, it fails really bad, right? This is one reason, you know, Google would love to launch something like this to help blind users. We can't launch something like this. This just doesn't work. This is not reliable, right? This is just a, a toy demo. This is not a reliable thing. Um, and there's an even more fundamental problem. Even if it worked reliably, like, we don't even know what the metric is. Like, how do we know we've succeeded? Um, so this is a slide I got from Jitendra Malik. Um, you know, we don't have a, a, a good way of evaluating the quality of these captions. Um, and you can generate a caption that, you know, does well by these automatic metrics like blue score and it has very little correlation to the content of the image. Um, and, uh, you know, the captions that, even the captions that people like, usually just capture a small aspect of the image and they're not describing everything that's going on. So, you know, this is really not a well-posed problem. So we thought, how can we, but it's cool, right? So what can we do? How can we come up with a, a way to um, formalize this better so that we can at least measure progress more objectively? So um, we came up with this idea. Actually, this idea has been around for a while. It's called uh, referring expressions. It's an old idea from the linguistics community. It was introduced into the, um, the computer vision community a couple of years ago by Tamara Berg's group. So the, the, the idea is the following. A random user comes in and picks a region of interest in the image. For example, this guy here. And then they generate a sentence to describe that region of the image. And that sentence is called a referring expression. And now some other person listens to that expression and has to decode it and figure out which possible region in the image were you talking about. And, if, and they'll click on it. And if they click on the one that you had in mind, you both get points. And this is like the essence of communication, right? It's a social thing. It's not just describing things in a vacuum. You're trying to convey information to a listener and you have shared state which is the image in common. So, um, uh, so what we want to do is to create a model that can generate, given a region, it can generate an expression such that when that uh, expression is uh, listened to, it, uh, it will be decoded correctly and tell you uh, um, the region that you had in mind. So it's a little bit like an autoencoder with language as a bottleneck. Um, and the nice thing about this is that it's very easy to measure performance, right? You just look at distance between the true location you had in mind and the actual location you clicked on. Um, so, you know, language is the, is the, is the bottleneck and, and you, it's like a noisy channel model. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, so the baseline approach is, so um, um, I'll tell you in more detail about the data later, but we build on MS Cocoa and we collected um, uh, descriptions for specific regions. So the baseline model is uh, we'll have a region and we have um, some uh, expression associated with that region and we'll just train up one of these um, CNN, RNN hybrids in the way that we did before, right? So we're going to maximize the likelihood of the words associated with that region given the region features, right? And th these region features are derived from the CNN. And this is a maximum likelihood problem. We'll just train it with HDD, okay? Um, and so that's the listener. Uh, and what about the speaker? Well, the speaker, what we're going to do, we're going to simplify the problem a little and have a finite set of candidate regions that the listener has to disambiguate between. And um, basically, they have, in this example, I'm just showing two regions, but we'll, we'll run a region proposal algorithm and get a few hundred candidates. And basically, they have to say, oh, I wonder which region the user was, the speaker had in mind. So we're going to just pick the region which, has the max, which maximizes the likelihood of the observed word sequence. Right? So that can be computed by looking at the likelihood compute, uh, associated from the language model. So how likely was that sequence of words? to come from the language model when applied to region R as opposed to region R prime. So it's a maximum likelihood decoder. Um, so that's going to be easy to train. Um, but if you think about it, there's a bit of a problem, right? If we're just doing maximum likelihood training, there's really not much reason for the model to want to make elaborate expressions and to say something like the girl in pink as opposed to just the girl. Because um, it, as far as it knows, it's just being given this one box. And, you know, she's obviously a girl, and I could just say that, right? I don't need to uh, add any disambiguating phrases. 
Uh, so the problem is this is sort of too myopic, right? It's not looking at ambiguity in the image. Um, so we proposed, uh, so there's a way of sort of formalizing what you should be doing. Like what's the optimal solution to this problem? So this formalization comes from Posi Liang and colleagues. So the idea is the following. You have a speaker and a listener. And the expected utility of this game is given by this expression. So you pick a random region um, that's just some external source. The speaker generates a distribution over of words given region. And then the listener just generates a distribution over regions given the words. And you want to maximize that utility. So our decoder, our listener strategy, is just pick the region that has higher likelihood than any other region. OK, so we're going to treat that listener as fixed. So in that case, the utility, expected utility can be written in this form if we assume that we can pick any region equally likely, which isn't true in real images, right? There's always like photographer bias, but let's ignore that. So basically, this means if we want to maximize utility, we should ensure that the likelihood of the correct region is higher than the likelihood of any other region in the image. Now, depending on your background, you'll think max margin training, or you'll think softmax loss, right? And so we actually have both versions in the paper. Um, I prefer the softmax version because it has the following very nice probabilistic interpretation. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take all of the regions and give them to the listener. And instead of scoring them separately, we're going to train the model to maximize the likelihood, uh, sorry, the posterior probability of the correct region given the, given the data, as opposed to the likelihood of generating the data. So this is, um, and this is normalized over all of the candidate regions. So you get some sort of discriminative flavor here because you're trading off one region with another. And in the speech community, this is called MMI training, maximum mutual information. Right? But it's just um, maximum posterior training as opposed to maximum likelihood training. So um, critically, the weights uh, um, are shared between all of these. And when we do a backprop step, we're going to push through all of these at the same time. So the models are now being encouraged to, the speaker is going to be encouraged to generate words which will maximize this objective, which is taking into account the fact that there might be multiple regions that are similar. So it's going to create words that are distinguishing between these regions. OK. So basically, if we stack these two models together, we have a, a speaker model, which is an RNN, a CNN and an RNN. And then we use the, we freeze the parameters. We use the same model in the listener. And the listener is trying to dis use that model to, to rank the different regions. We'll get a distribution probability of different regions. OK, so there are the two approaches. So we have the baseline and this new thing. Um, we need some data to evaluate it on. So like I mentioned earlier, we take the MS Coco data set. Um, we pick the subset of images which have some ambiguity in them. So there's at least two people, or at least two cars, or two giraffes. Um, we cap them so there's at most four, because we don't want really, really small things. And that ends up giving us 26,000 images. We ask Amazon Mechanical Turk workers to describe the, it, the, the unique object. So like here, we, click, we show them this zebra, and we say, please describe this zebra. And then one person says, zebra looking towards the camera. It's pretty hard clue to interpret. Another one says the third zebra from the left. It's also pretty complicated, actually. Um, this one's a little easier because it's low. So this is more like a relative <coughs> comparison. Um, here, it's more like a local attribute. A girl wearing glasses and a pink shirt, right? There's only one person wearing glasses. So if you've got a glasses detector, you can get it. Um, or some, an Asian girl with a pink shirt eating at the table. Um, so it turns out that people put in un redundant attributes. You don't need to say that she's Asian. They're both Asian in this case. And they're both girls, actually. Um, so, but they, you know, people just have this free-from um, answers. So we have this data set that's actually publicly available. Um, there was actually another data set that's uh, similar. So this paper I mentioned that introduced the referring game had a data set. They built not on top of Coco, which didn't exist back then, but on top of the image clef data set, which isn't as interesting. And their sentences tend to be a lot shorter. So this is the distribution over sentence lengths that we have. This is what they have. So for example, um, uh, we have some images in common. Uh, so um, this particular thing in the image, our worker said a bowl of cut vegetables uh, or, or a bowl of mushrooms, greens and tomatoes sitting next to chili with sour cream. I mean, yeah. you know, we're only paying them like one cent, but they write <laughs> these long sentences. I don't remember how much we paid them. But actually, the, the mechanical Turk workers really liked this task. We got good reviews. Um, the UNC data set, you know, is very sort of telegraphic description. So it's not as interesting. But nevertheless, it's, a, it's another data set that's out there. So um, we did comparisons on both data sets. So we, um, and I'm not going to walk you through all the details because I don't have time. But the bottom line is that we get about a 5% improvement um, in, in terms of precision at one using the MMI training as opposed to maximum likelihood training. 
Um, so the numbers are, you know, whatever, you can stare at them in the paper. Um, more interesting are the qualitative results. So, it, you know, it's really quite remarkable. Um, so here are two candidate regions. If I point at this region and I say, generate me a sentence, it will say a man wearing a black jacket. And I point at this one, it will say a woman in a black dress. Um, you know, okay, here are the pizza on the left, the pizza on the right. Pretty cool. Now, it doesn't always work, of course, right? So here it says, I click on that region and it says a bowl of soup. No, it's not soup, they're chopped carrots. Um, here it says a bus on the right. Well, it depends from whose perspective, right? Arguably, that's, that's pretty confusing. Um, and here it says uh, a, a woman in a blue shirt, and it's, I think it's a baby, right? So it's not a woman. Um, the, I think the woman's holding the baby. I can't really see from here. Anyway, so you know, there are errors, but on the whole, it works quite well. <coughs> so that's the speaker. And then you can also um, uh, do the listener. If I generate a sentence, what region are you going to lock onto? So I'll say a giraffe on the left. Anyone who's worked with Coco knows there's a lot of giraffes in that data set. So I say giraffe on the left, and it, clicks, it picks on this. Say the giraffe on the right, it clicks on this. Um, man in red, it clicks on this. I'm not sure that's, maybe it's a man, it's hard to tell. Girl playing tennis, it clicks on that. Um, and so there's some more results, so I think I'm gonna skip that. So um, yeah, so that's, that's uh, some experiments we did there. So that's trying to get at this issue. First of all, trying to put captioning on a more objective basis. So we have nice hard numbers that are sort of unambiguous. And secondly, getting at the fact that language is communicative and assumes that there's a speaker and a listener. It's not just spitting words out into the vacuum. There's a reason that you're communicating and you need to take that into account. And if you look at the captions that people write themselves on their Facebook posts, they're communicating to their friends on Facebook who have some context. And out of context, those captions are usually totally meaningless. But if you take the history into account and you look at like the story that they're telling, then it might actually make sense. So I think, you know, if we think of that as a forward model, we should take that into account if we're trying to learn from uh, web data. All right, I'm going to switch gears now, put language on hold, um, and talk about a, a different kind of problem. Um, so uh, now we're going to, um, instead of generating a sentence, or instead of generating a, a label, we're going to generate like a million labels. Um, but what's sort of essentially one label per pixel. And so this task is called semantic segmentation. Um, and it's a well-studied problem in computer vision. Um, so a uh, very popular approach these days that tends to work well is, so you take a, a neural net, a conf net, and most of the models, if you remember from Tommy's talk this morning, they're all like these pyramids where you start with a big wide image and then you end up with a funnel and you, the final thing is just one number or maybe you know a thousand numbers. It's a distribution over labels for the whole image. So you end up having this very, very narrow bottleneck and that's the output. It's essentially a one-dimensional classification problem. But we don't want to do that. We have a million-dimensional classification problem. So we have to somehow back out from that bottleneck and uh, undo all of this information loss process and recover the uh, output labels. Okay? And the reason to go into this bottleneck in the first place is that this is you know, accumulating information from far away parts of the image so that you get global context. But now you have to deconvolve and undo that process to get a dense output. Okay, so um, these are some slides I got from um, Andrea Vidaldi in Oxford just to illustrate what's going on. So we have this sort of uh, funnel effect. This is all convolutional. And in most of these models, then you have a few fully connected layers that are just doing a nonlinear mapping of that final um, heat map to give you a distribution over labels. And you can actually th interpret that equivalently as being a convolution that where you basically there's no room to slide it, right? The size of this convolutional filter is exactly the size of the heat map. So it just sits on top of it and converts it into a vector. But if you do that approach, now if you have a larger image, you can slide it around and it becomes fully convolutional. But, um, so that's illustrated here. If you have a small little patch and it gives you a, a distribution of uh, labels, now um, you convert that into a convolution and you can slide it around and you'll get a heat map of responses. So this is, a, this is cool, and this is starting to give like a dense response. The problem is the, the resolution of this output is very small because um, you c there's not many places you can slide that, uh, that final heat map. Um, so what you need to do is you need to blow it back up to get a high resolution output. Um, so there's a variety of ways to do that, but basically they all have this the re reduction phase and then this upsampling phase. Now, you can't really recover information that you've lost from nowhere. I mean, where am I going to get this high resolution information from? So you can add these sort of shortcut connections um, in the middle, um, which will just borrow high frequency information from the, uh, from the upwards pass. Okay, and there's a variety of different papers that have, you know, look at different versions of this theme. Um, but they're all similar in spirit. 
Okay, so what did we do in this space? Um, so with doing, at a high level it's similar. Um, there's just a couple of details where we differ and we get better results. So um, one thing is, um, so this is work done by Jay Chen, who was our intern last year. He's a, he was a student at UCLA, he interned with us, now he works at Google, um, actually in, in the LA office. Um, and George Papandreou, um, who's on my team, he used to be a postdoc at UCLA, he also works for Google, uh, he's also in the LA office. <laughs> um, so uh, this is work that came out last year in iClear. So we're gonna take a, an image, we're gonna do this thing where we do the fully convolutional approach to get distributions over scores, but it's kind of low res. So we're gonna just blow it up using bilinear uh, uh, interpolation, but this is very blurry, so we're gonna try to compensate for that and get a really sharp image by sticking a conditional random field on top. So this is kind of cool because it combines deep neural nets with graphical models, which is something I like to do. Um, okay, so there are two tricks under the hood. So the, the first trick is, is the following. So we talked about reducing the, um, having this bottleneck layer. And the reason is that you want to get global context so that every, um, every neuron in this hidden layer has seen the whole image. Okay, but you don't have to so aggressively filter down. You can just do this trick, this old trick from the signal processing community called the uh, Atru algorithm. It's French for convolution with holes. And the idea is when you convolve, you stick holes in your filter, so zeros, and you basically dilate your filter so it's bigger than normal. And that's going to essentially increase the size of the receptor field at no additional cost. And of course, you don't actually have to multiply by zero. You could just, sh you just have a, oh, somebody edited my slide. OK. Um, yeah, you just have the shift factor, um, uh, shift factor of R. I think George must have gone in and edited this last night for me. So that's good. So here we, we have an input stride of two. So it's the only difference from standard convolution. This was um, recently rediscovered. <laughs> I see he took the reference out. So the, uh, there's a guy, Vlad Colton, who had an iClear paper this year who called it dilute, dil, dilated convolution. Um, but in fact, it's an old idea. So, um, uh, but it's a good idea, right? It's a very simple trick. So that's trick one. So that's gonna give us um, a higher resolution bottleneck. So we, don't, we only reduce by a factor of eight instead of a factor of 32. If you don't reduce that much, then the going back out is not gonna be so hard. So the second trick is when we go back up, um, we want to maintain sharpness of the image. So this is another trick that I learned from George. This is standard in the graphics community called bilateral filtering or edge aware filtering. So, um, so the idea is the following. We have some um, noisy signal, f of y, and we want to convolve it with like a, uh, uh, we want to smooth out the noise. But what we're going to do is we're going to say the output version of the image is the same as the input, but where we're going to integrate over regions that are close by, but also similar in appearance. Right? And if they're not similar in appearance, even if they're close, we're not going to average across them. So I, I don't want to smooth across edge boundaries. So if there's a sudden discontinuity in the appearance, then I basically insert an edge in my filtering process and I don't propagate the information. Okay, so this is a standard thing and it um, gives a big difference in practice. So this is an example I found on the, edge, uh, the web somewhere. So here's some image. If we just do standard Gaussian smoothing, it's very blurry. If you do edge aware smoothing, it's, it maintains sharpness. Okay, so um, you can apply that to a real valued signal, but we're dealing with discrete outputs, right? These are labels. So how do you combine them? Well, so there's a clever idea, um, not due to us, but this guy, Kaltoon, who I mentioned, and Philip Krayenbuhl from a few years ago, where they integrate this inside of a conditional random field. And the idea is the following. Let's have like a POTS model that says, if I'm dog, then my neighbors should be dog as well, unless there's an edge between us, and then I'm gonna cut the edge, right? And then we can be different classes. So that's basically the bilateral filter. So we're gonna make the edge potentials essentially implement that um, bilateral filtering equation. And that means that when we do mean field inference under the hood, we can use the bilateral filtering algorithms, which are quite fast, um, to do the updates. And I'm not gonna walk you through this, but I don't know if Mike Jordan's still here, but this is like standard fully factorized mean field inference. Um, it turns out that if you look at the math, you can implement this exactly as a recurrent neural network. So, so now, if you think about it, it's just this, this uh, circuit where you're uh, taking information from your neighbors and doing that repeatedly. Well, you can unroll that in time. That's what an RNN is. So the RNN is doing inference in a graphical model, and they're mathematically equivalent. If you untie the parameters, then they're no longer equivalent, and you can squeeze a few extra percent performance from the RNN, which you couldn't have in the, uh, in the CRF. Um, okay, so does this actually help? Well, the iteration does because it's sort of spreading information across your neighbors, right? So this is the, um, the output of the ConfNet, and in one iteration of CRF inference, 
sharpens the edges quite a lot, and then a few additional in iterations help a little bit more. But of course, you get diminishing returns. OK, so if we look at um, some examples on the Pascal data set, this is the, the ConfNet um, doing semantic segmentation, I guess, horse and person. And then the CRF is sharpening up the edges. And this results in, you know, if you measure it quantitatively, you get better numbers. Um, so basically, you know, before CNNs came along, performance is about 50%. Then people did whatever they used to do, but they just swap out boosted decision trees, swap in a CNN, you get a 10%, 15% boost just like that with like almost no effort. And then you can squeeze out a little more juice by putting a CRF on the top. Um, truth in advertising, if you use a better CNN, you don't really need that CRF. So very new results Jay did. He replaced the VGG model with a residual net, a deep residual network, and then um, redid everything. And now the CRF only gets you like half a percent win. So it's like, eh, it's not worth it. Actually, from an engineering point of view, that's great because it's a kind of pain to implement. So now we just, ConfNets, you know, we just run it in TensorFlow. I have colleagues who will make that work on the phone and it's like, that's it. We get, we get our model on the phone for free. But if you want to do something exotic like a graphical model, then you have to code it yourself and that's not so much fun. Getting that on the phone is not easy. Okay, so here's some more results. Um, you know, the CRF is giving you um, some benefits. So this is the CNN on its own with the residual net, and the CRF smooths, you know, cleans it up a little bit. But in general, they're very similar. Um, but you know, despite okay, so the CRF isn't maybe getting a big win, but I don't really care. The point is, it works quite well. Um, this is fully supervised training, right? So someone was paid to label all these pixels, and that's a separate story. Everything today is fully supervised. We have other work on weekly supervised training of these models using EM, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, you can apply it to outdoor scenes. This is a data set from MPII. Um, this was an internal data set. We had never trained it on selfies. One of our colleagues ran it, and we is just trained on person, non-person. Works really well. Why would you want to do that? Well, then you can do all kinds of cool little tricks. Like, you know, you can um, defocus everything that isn't the person or saturate the person and those kinds of things. And we can do this on device, and you can say, oh, do you like this? Yeah, sure, I like that. Um, so uh, hopefully this will be coming to an Android phone near you within a year or so. Um, so, okay, so there's actually a bunch of other problems that are similar in spirit, um, where basically the input is an image and the output is something which is image-like, right? So I talked about semantic labels, but you could imagine instead of predicting labels, you want to predict the depth of every pixel from the camera, and maybe up to some unknown scale factor. Um, so that's uh, image to depth. We have a model to do that. And um, that's, you can get a lot of training data for that very easily just by using a depth sensor. And then you can derive surface normals from that. And you can predict surface normals. So you're predicting a little three-dimensional vector. And you can have one model that does all of these at the same time. Um, and David Eigen has some work on this. And we've been building on his work. Um, but I don't have any new results to show you at this point. Another cute example of this is colorization. And again, you can, you can create infinite amounts of training data for free, right? So there's a whole bunch of papers on this. I'm not claiming we've done anything new. This is just like shooting ducks in the barrel. We have this hammer, this dense prediction model, and we can solve all of these problems with the literally the same code. And you just put in different data, um, and you get this for free, which is very nice. OK. Um, so let me tell you. Um, uh, one application of the segmentation stuff beyond the sort of photo editing thing. Uh, it's not, this actually has a bunch of moving parts in it, and there are many people involved. But this is, um, I think, potentially quite impactful if, if we can make it really work, as opposed to work well enough for a conference paper. Um, so the idea is you take a photo of your meal, and it's going to analyze what you're eating and tell you the nutritional content. Now, this is, of course, a holy grail. In general, it's impossible because you don't know how it was cooked. OK, fine. So you can ask the, the idea is that you would ask the user questions if you're unsure. Was it, you know, is this whole wheat flour or is it regular flour? Um, are these fried or, or steamed? You know, you can't really tell. So you can ask some questions. Or maybe you know from the GPS signal what restaurant you're at, and, or you know that this person's vegetarian, whatever. Right? You can use a bunch of sign information to reduce ambiguity. And if there's still ambiguity, you can ask the user. Um, but the point is to try to minimize the amount of effort that people put in when they're doing food logging, because right now it's a pain. And um, you know, if you're a diabetic or something, this, you know, your life really depends on this. So you, we have a motivated user pool out there. And it would be helpful if we could help them. So um, I'm not going to walk through every, well, I actually do have time to walk through this. So um, uh, basically, um, we're going to take a food image. And we'll run some classifiers to just you know, quickly figure out what kinds of foods are present. This is just a standard multi-label classifier. 
like a tagger like I started to talk with. And then that's not enough though, right? A lot of systems can do this. But if I take a photo of my meal that says, oh, you're eating eggs and pancakes, you're going to say, great, I know that. I just bought it. Tell me something I didn't know, right? So, so this is not very useful to the user. I mean, maybe it's mildly useful because you can log it in your food diary without having to type. So, you know, it's kind of useful. But it's not as useful as actually getting quantitative answers out. So to get quantitative answers out, we need to know how big the things are. Um, so that means we have to do uh, segmentation. And of course, we're going to use the semantic segmentation system I just described to do that. And we're also going to want to estimate the physical 3D size, not size in pixel space. So for that, we need to know how big these things are in the physical world. So um, I'll come to that in a minute. And now assuming that we've got some estimate of the volume of these things, and we have some magical database that will convert volume into, um, and we know the density of the foods, and we can uh, maybe count individual instances, we could come up with a food diary like this. And then from that, we could derive a number, which is the final calorie content or carb content or whatever, right? It doesn't have to just be calories. People often say, why don't we directly go from image to calories, right? Sure, we could do that, but I, 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 I say there's two reasons not to do that. First of all, we don't have any training data of that form. And secondly, more importantly, it wouldn't be very interpretable to the user. So, you know, you take a photo and Google, Google says you're eating a thousand calories. Holy crap. I, Google's always right. But it's, no, we're not always right. So if, if I show you the intermediate state of the model, you can say, ah, you think it's a thousand calories because you think I'm eating 10 eggs, but I'm really only eating two. You just screwed up. I can go in and like click that label and say, no, no, uh, you know, this is whatever, it, it, this is uh, a tofu thingy, not, not, it's not real bacon, honest, it's, it's tofu, uh, it's fake bacon. And uh, you know, how can the system know that? That's very easy for the user to go in and fix, and then it can, re it can just recompute this on the fly, right? This is a deterministic function of this. This is the state of the world. This is a very low dimensional summary. So we should estimate the state of the world and then give you the summary statistic, not directly go to the summary statistic. Anyway. Um, so let's dive in a little bit more. So the segmentation, there's nothing new here methodologically. Uh, we just you know, collected a different data set and ran the tool I showed you. These are some results of that tool. Um, so these are some ground truth images. This is the deep lab system with the CRF. We tweaked it a little bit to add a global contextual prior, um, uh, which is sort of a popular thing these days. And that gives you some benefit. For example, this little patch of tiramisu I guess it was big enough that the, CR the CRF didn't want to kill it. Um, but globally, that's very unlikely. We don't think tiramisu is present in this image. It looks like a breakfast image. So we can kill that false positive off. Chicken quesadilla gets killed off. And we're left with pancakes and butter. The butter actually, that was a false negative, right? Or oh, we never got butter in the first place. So you know, it's not perfect, but it's a very hard problem, actually. Um, so we wanted to release this data, but the lawyers wouldn't let us for reasons I can tell you later. Uh, so that's, that's uh, I've already told you how that works. This part is very similar. Um, so we're going to use the same conf, deconf net that I mentioned. Um, we're just going to train it on a different data set. So we collected, uh, we took a Kinect camera. Oh, so it's an Intel RealSense camera. It's an RGBD camera. We you know, aimed it at some dishes of food. This is what the sensor gives us. This is what the neural net gives us. So it's, you know, it's matching the real data quite closely. And it smooths out noise. It's kind of nice. Um, but that's just giving you, you know, distance from the camera. Um, we need to convert that into volume. So um, this is where we started to get into sort of demo where in order to meet the conference deadline. So we assume it's on a flat table. We use Rantac to detect that flat table. We know the height of the uh, pixels off that table. So now you can get this sort of voxelized representation. We're assuming we've already segmented the foods into types so we can get the volume per type. And we wanted to measure how well we're doing, right? Uh, the, uh, the first review said this is cool, but we need some numbers here. So how do you get the ground truth of food? Well, it turns out that you can buy fake food. Um, so this is one of my colleagues, Alex Gorbin, and we ordered um, food made of rubber from this company called NASCO that sells this stuff to nutritionists to train them to do size estimation. Um, and uh, these have standardized sizes, which we actually verified using the water displacement method. It was like a high school or uh, elementary science project. It was kind of fun. So we got ground truth data for these, the volumes of these things. And we ran them through our algorithm. And then we measured the error in um, when we used the predicted depth, uh, which is in red, versus using the real RGBD sensor. And you can see that you know, we're off. We're within like 20% of the truth. Uh, off by about 20%. So it's, you know, it's not bad. It's not going to be super accurate, but it, it's, it's, it's reasonable. Um, 
So that's giving you the volume. Now, to convert that into calories, we now need to know the nutritional density of all of these foods. It's actually very difficult to get that data. And of course, that's a, that depends a lot on how you cooked it, right? And what oils you used and, and all of that. So that's very difficult. Um, so uh, we didn't really solve that problem. That's kind of a, a weakness in this. Um, but we did find some other data set where they had uh, like ground truth calories and images. This is, for, again, from Microsoft, actually. Very small data set. Um, but at least they had images with calories, and they were getting an error of about, um, their system's called Menu Match. They got an error of about 230 calories. Um, there's an app you can get for the iPhone called MealSnap that uses mechanical Turk workers, uh, and they were getting a worse error, even though there's humans in the loop. That app is now out of business, um, <laughs> uh, for <laughs> maybe because it wasn't accurate enough. Um, it turns out they didn't report this in the original paper. If you just use the prior, you get, <laughs> you get about as good as their menu match system. So they were using classical features. If you just swap in a CNN um, and use a CNN classifier, you get much lower error. You get like 140 calories off. So it's like half the error rate. This isn't testing the full system end to end. We weren't really able to do that. Um, but it's testing a piece of it. So we've done sort of unit tests, but we haven't really done an integration test. Um, and then one of my colleagues uh, ported a subset of the system onto the phone, and it runs in real time, actually. Um, and you know, we had some sort of mock-up where the you know, user gives feedback. But uh, um, where, where are we today? You know, th when this came out, there was a huge amount of interest in the press. Actually, show of hands, who had heard of this before I talked about it today? A few people. OK. Anyway, you know, it, got, it got a lot of coverage. Um, you know, we weren't launching a project, though. This is a research demo. Um, and it's actually on hold from a, like a product perspective because there's a lot of sort of unsolved problems here. I'm hoping to persuade some product team to take it, take it over and run with it. Um, there's a lot of engineering to get right, but some of the core technology I, I think we have developed at this point. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, um, well, I've been talking about segmentation uh, where we label every pixel. Um, but we might want to distinguish individual instances of an object class, right? So it's not enough to label these as chair. We want to know this is chair one, this is chair two. You can imagine in the food setting, it's like piece of toast one versus piece of toast two, right? Um, or like in biology, you want to know how many cells are in this image. Uh, have they multiplied when I added this reagent? Um, you want to do people counting, car counting. I mean, counting is a very important problem. Instance segmentation is one way to get there. Um, this can also give you some idea about the shape and perhaps the, what, what the object is. Gives you more detailed information. So that's something um, we're working on. And then uh, another thing we want to do is we want to like integrate these all into a single model. With, and so you would get multitask training for free. They're all extremely similar, right? So these dense output models, they basically can share a lot of the computation and then they have sort of domain specific deconvolutional stacks. We can also do object detection with more or less the same base model. We can do image captioning. So we can share a lot of the computation and share a lot of the, the data. This is you know, a standard thing. Multitask training is very simple with the neural nets. One reason they're popular. Um, these output signals are all correlated with each other. right? The neural net's not explicitly modeling that. These are all functions of the same hidden state. So there is some correlation being captured um, organically, as it were. Um, but you can also go ahead and explicitly model dependencies between these signals in the spirit of a CRF. And that's something we're looking at. Um, but we don't have results at this point. And then you know, the grand challenge is, could we build a system to understand images like this? OK. Time for a few questions. Uh, back to your the first thing on the the language communication. Yes. So one thing um, you were asking people to describe one portion of an image. Yes. And so naturally, when I'm describing a portion of an image, I look at the entire rest of it and have to distinguish that part. Yes. And you were training a network to understand from that point of view, but each your particular network there was attempting to to describe a patch of the image based only on that patch of an image. I no, no, thought. it had global context as well. Oh, it did. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Thanks. So I didn't fine. explicitly say that, but it was on the slide. <laughs> so uh, all the examples you're showing here are not very cluttered thing, right? For a very cluttered thing and it has a lot of occlusion, mm -hmm. what, what do you think it, the, 
the, the challenge. I mean, well, this is a cluttered image, but I... But, I, I, but this is not being done. No, yeah. no, sure. Fair enough. Um, I mean, the Pascal ones are cluttered and Coco is cluttered. But, uh, but I agree, occlusion is one of the biggest problems. So we actually have, I mean, I didn't talk about it today. We have an iClear paper where we're using generative models to try to decompose the scene into layers. And then um, it, it's a bit like what Tommy was saying earlier, right? If you can rectify your image, your, your object into a canonical frame, so you, you derotate it and you standardize the location, then it's pretty easy to recognize. So you just want to basically decompose the image into layers, canonicalize the location, and then the, the labeling is cheap and easy <laughs> um, figuring out what it is. So the problem is really sort of to uh, factor apart. Um, and if you have a depth sensor, that's easier. But we were doing it from um, RGB images. But I agree, that's a, that's a big open problem. More questions? All right, let's thank Kevin again. <laughs>